develop in our egos. Okay, you know the idea, the the real role role of the archetype of meaning is that the contents of the unconscious can um, uh, become conscious in uh, in consciousness. You know, and uh, but the arc, the anima is the archetype of life. You know, and one other thing, and I'm getting this out of Hillman too, and uh, uh, in, in his book, Anima, the Anatomy of a Personified Notion, you know, is that you need to distinguish between um, the feminine, eros, the feeling function, and the anima. You know, now the anima is the archetype of life, and what Young tells us, or Emma Young says in here too, is that there's two aspects of it. One is that it represents the, uh, well, it's the archetype of life, but the um, it, it, there's two aspects. One is the, is the universal anima, and the other one is the, uh, is the, is the fact that, um, uh, 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 see, the reason that the anima is not such a big high in that, the reason the anima is not so stressed in women, even though they have access to the universal anima as well as ourselves, a- as men, <laughs> the, um, the, 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 the man tends to overvalue the masculine aspect. Okay, so what is unconscious in him is the feminine aspect, which represents the archetype of life, you know. Now, women tend to uh, be very, seem to me more um, in tune with being uh, with life because they're the bearer of life. You know, they seem to have a better relationship with and also with things uh, like um, uh, that, that. um, were mentioned by by Hillman, the feminine feminine uh, uh, the thinking of the feminine, which is uh, let's just go over here, uh, not of, of the feminine, but of genuine awareness. Now, this is of the anima. Is it's worthless uh, and re- feminine energies, soul, the inner world, the wisdom of nature are represented. And, and, you know, women often <laughs> don't have these either, you know, uh, they're, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, Marion Woodman spent her whole life trying to become conscious of femininity, you know, in her book, uh, My Father's House, it is the story of how she, uh, as a, a person uh, with food addictions and very intellectual and everything, discovered or became feminine herself, you know, became conscious of her own femininity. And as Annette said, I think last time, is that this is really the key to, I think, uh, the, um, the water bearer, the one who carries, carries uh, the unconscious uh, Aquarius, the age of... Uh, Pisces is ending. We're in the death throes of Pisces. So now we're entering the area of, an, an era of Aquarius, the one that who carries uh, the unconscious with him. Well, how do you carry the unconscious with you if you are a thinking function person imprisoned in uh, the masculine uh, thinking and uh, scientific uh, world of what which... Um, you know, uh, Hillman calls cave awareness, the one that's highly valued by, valued by the ego, uh, you know, outer world, cultural, I have choices. It's all about the light of consciousness, the light of ego, of solving problems, of being in, in um, mundane reality, of strengthening ego, of developing ego, of controlling everything around us, and of progress, okay? Now that's the, um, yeah, hi, I, Azeen, too. Yeah, oh, and Dawn is here. I gotta keep my eye on this, but anyway, 
So what, what we're going, uh, the, the genuine awareness, which Hillman mentions, the feminine energies are of, of the visionary. Of, now, these are the ones of not of women, but of the unconscious. You know, these are the feminine. And, and we're, everything we're talking about here is the, um, the interplay of masculine psychic energy and the interplay of feminine psychic energy. The, the, only, the feminine psychic energy wants to become conscious. And the way it becomes conscious, the archetype of life, the way the archetype of life, the lumen natura, the light of nature, becomes conscious is through the archetype of meaning, which is represented by the animus. Through, through the, the uh, archetype of meaning, which is the animus, the archetype of life can become conscious in our egos, you know, and, and we, uh, w- the ego can leave its um, king ego. And, and, and in fairy tales, you know, the king, uh, the king's sons can never lift the curse, cure the enchantment. The only one that can do, do it is the one who is allied with the world of nature. And uh, that is the, um, the fool. Not, not his favorite son, but the fool. And with animal helpers and psychic magic, he can lift the cure, the cure the enchantment. The curse is, um, is, is being, uh, being imprisoned in the outer world. You know, you're imprisoned in the outer world and have no access to the inner world. That's the curse. You know, that's what is this curse on us. You know, now, um, what, what, it, it, it's a very strange interplay, you know, I mean, the way the uh, contents become conscious in the outer world is through the masculine archetype of meaning, and the way that the uh, ego becomes, uh, uh, returns to that world, or opens up that world, is through animal helpers, you know, the uh, nature, and anyway, Let's let's just go on now. The whole thing on on, on um, in Emma Young's book, she is emphasizing the um, elemental uh, aspect of the feminine, and and her book in in German is called Naturwesen, means nature beings. So everything she's talking about here are swan maidens, water beings, tree nymphs. And pretty soon she's going to get in to, um, to uh, the goddesses, the, the, the goddess of nature, who she um, uh, associates with Cybele, uh, who was, um, I believe uh, he was the uh, mother of Attis, you know, the one that we had got Christmas trees after. But, um, you know, here's, here is... Uh, Cybele. She is the goddess of nature. And uh, she's the she's our goddess of nature. She'd look different if she somebody else. And and the other uh, at the other aspect of these are the principles that lie behind anima. And the other one is um, Aphrodite, you know, the goddess of love. Now, here she is with Dionysus. You know, but now, uh, you, you know, uh, men who talk about the anima often, you know, it's all about lust. You know, it's not about that. It's about um, the the goddesses, uh, the uh, the universal anima behind uh, the uh, uh, the feminine energies of of the wisdom of nature, the goddesses of nature, which are the goddesses, uh, the mother goddess, Cybele, and and the goddess of love, Aphrodite. Okay, and then out of that, since since those are gone now, the only thing we have are are, uh, swan maidens and elfin world and and water beings and things like that, these lesser gods. You know, uh, who can let um, the um, what what was this wonderful uh, uh, 
feminine Germanic religions the, of the Celts and the Germanics and the Nordics, you know, became <laughs> obliterated when, you know, they cut down all the sacred oaks and, and everything like that. And, uh, you know, pretty soon um, it all went underground and it went underground in two ways in this folk, uh, folk religion of the fairy hills and the elfin realms. And the other place it went to was into alchemy. You know, uh, that was the high end, high end of the uh, of the uh, underground religion. But anyway, let's let's talk about this uh, real quickly because I mean it's just absolutely beautiful the way Emma Young, especially the way she ends this. But one one of the dreams that she uh, she first uh, let's just go through a couple dreams. Um, you know, this, these these are. Uh, uh, beings of, of the uh, water beings. We went through the swan maidens. I'd like to do one a swan maiden dream, one more swan maiden dream before we're done. And uh, this one, uh, she, Emma Young mentions this dream, but here, let me tell you how she mentions it here, uh, this dream. She uh, mentions it a little bit later here, but I just wanna read how she writes it. Uh, uh, a young man dreams a white bird flies into the window of his room. He, uh, it turns into a little girl uh, but, and speaks to him with a human voice. Now, that's the way she told the dream. Here's, here's the actual dream, because this was the dream of her husband. And it was his original uh, anima dream. She's, this is Young's dream. In the dream, I found myself in a, a magnificent Italian loggia with pillars, a marble floor, and a marble balustrade. I was sitting on a gold Renaissance chair, and in front of me was a table of rare beauty. It was made of green stone like emerald. Now, this is before he discovered alchemy, but it's close to the emerald tablets of Hermes Trismegistus. And uh, there I sat looking at a distance for the log was set high up on a, the tower castle. My children were sitting at the table too. Suddenly a white bird descended, a small seagull or a dove, gracefully came to rest on, rest on the table. And I signed uh, to the children to be still so that they would not frighten away the pretty white bird. Immediately the dove was transformed into a little girl about eight years old with golden blonde hair. She ran off with the children and played with them among the colonnades of the castle. I remained lost in thought, musing about what I had just experienced. The little girl returned and tenderly placed her arms around my neck. Then she suddenly vanished. The dove was back and spoke in a human voice. Only in the first hours of the night can I transform myself to a human being. While the, may, the, while the male do, dove is busy with the 12 dead, it should say. I copy this from someone else. Then, then she flew off into the blue air and I awoke. Now that's, that is the dream. This was the dream that introduced Jung to the anima. And this dream actually followed his decision to, uh, to have, a, to, um, he had just dismissed Tony Wolf, uh, you know, from her analysis, and he had, uh, she had awoken such energies in him that he uh, uh, that he had a dream where, and we're going to talk about this, where the um, elfin world was going to carry her into a mountain, and they are singing as they carry her into the mountain, and she, he knew that he could not let her go. So he decided to ask her back to work with him. And, you know, also there was some romantic interest, but um, she, she was one of, along with Emma Young, Tony Wolf, Carrie Baines, um, Marie-Louise von Franz, and um, uh, Anelia Yaffe were, and also I would say too, uh, Gerhard Adler, you know, who we wrote, read the uh, Living Symbol book, trained one-on-one -on -one with Young, you know. So Tony Wolf was not just his paramour, but he really uh, did um, have that aspect to it. 
to it. But um, anyway, that was uh, the anima dream of, of Jung, the one that really introduced him to the anima as well, you know. But um, so the anima, uh, the dream that, that he started out here with, uh, I am going through a dense wood. There come, this is of a young man who, uh, who is um, exposed to the dangers of desiccation, dryness, the wasteland, you know. Uh, and he dreamed as follows. I am going through a dense wood. There comes towards me a woman enveloped in a dark veil who takes me by the hand and says that she will lead me to the wellspring of life. And uh, this anima represents a connection with the spring or the source of life in the unconscious when no such connection exists now, you know, uh, or when it is broken or there is a state of stagnation and it's uh, that's often so disturbing that the um, person seeks help, you know, because of their, um, Young said most of the people that he worked with were ones that um, had, um, who, who were very successful who, in the outer world, very successful, credibly educated, very high end. And yet they knew that uh, there was something missing in their heart, you know? And so uh, that's what they came to him. Now we're gonna talk too about a guy who is absolutely fascinating. His name is William Sharp, but um, uh, we're, and we'll read the story of, of, he wrote under a different name of Fiona MacLeod, and he was from Scotland. And uh, uh, he, uh, this is him, he married his, uh, his first cousin. He was, um, Originally, a uh, uh, a uh, his father wanted him to become uh, go into the ins insurance or something like that. He worked in a bank for three years, and then he started to um, uh, know this was not right for him. He started to turn to art and literary criticism, and uh, then he started to write poems himself. But, um, and he finally had one poem that had a distinctly feminine nature. And he couldn't publish it. And he said he really couldn't write it under his own name, William Sharp, by the way. It's kind of a logos name, William Sharp, you know, this, this, this sword of discrimination, you know. But um, so he wrote under the name of Fiona McLeod. And uh, one of the reasons he was forced to write was because of this dream from childhood that he had, uh, which was, um, he wrote into a poem later. And it, it, this, is, this really happened to him. And he called this woman that he saw as a child, Star Eyes or Lady of the Sea. And uh, um, he, he uh, she was uh, just, well, here, here's how he saw her. Not a wing beat in the sky, still and dazzling white, the falling, falling snow. Not a cloudlet veiled the stars on high. No waves stirred the frozen lake below. Now, I also remember that he is from Scotland. All of his poems are about the beauty of the nature that he found in Scotland and in the sea surrounding Scotland. And uh, William Butler Yeats, who read his poetry, said uh, that there was no voice he heard that was more uh, in tune with the simple people and the nature of Scotland. Okay, and uh, 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 this was this was because he wasn't writing it. There was, his anima was writing it. This is this is the kind of the punchline. But uh, then, so there's not a wing beat in the sky, still in dazzling white, the fallen slow, not a cloud veiled the stars ab above, no wave stirred this frozen lake below. But from the deep up uh, on the lake, there was a tree that had grown, uh, somehow been flooded and had grown up 
uh, and it was completely under the lake. He could see it through the ice and, uh, uh, and on a branch, a woman climbed towards me, gazing upward through the frigid screen and standing there upon the glassy sheet, parting me from the depths so black and dim, I could see now close beneath my feet, her white body gleaming limb by limb. She in muffled misery probed to find in that rigid roof some fissured space. She is always, always in my mind. Never will I forget uh, her shadowy face. This, uh, uh, this water being, this Nixie imprisoned uh, in ice corresponds to uh, other enchanted princes, princesses who are um, in glass mountains, um, et cetera, you know, just aren't. Uh, so now, I, I, let's just go, go through this, uh, this fascinating tale. And I, I think we don't have uh, time for just more than this one. And then uh, one other one I wanted to read uh, that I put in the text of the email. Um, by the way, any of you uh, people who are first attending here, if you will put your email in um, the uh, in the chat, I will. Um, we can uh, provide you with the texts to the uh, thing because I think what we're going to do is we're going to finish this up next time just with a little review, or and maybe also start on um, on the um, uh, animus and anima in fairy tales. I think it would be better to do that and then to bring Hillman in uh, just a, 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 in little bits because Hillman is so dense uh, that it would take us forever to get through it. And, uh, and I, I, even though it is absolutely a beautiful, beautiful um, uh, book. And I, I, it's just quite revelation, revelatory to me. But anyway, William Sharp, um, I told this story, he spent three years in a bank, resigned uh, his uh, position to uh, uh, start uh, art and literary uh, criticism in a, um, and published his own poems. He brought, it brought him in touch with art and literary circles. The, the, the story we're gonna tell here is one of active imagination one of the really amazing active imaginations in recent times, you know, uh, what, what is it? Um, you, you know, this, this young really rediscovered ancient, ancient practices. You know, what uh, Peter Kingsley says that all our culture came from people lying down in dark spaces because people did active imaginations all the time. You know, uh, in, in, uh, in fact, it's still being done. I mean, he, 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 it's particularly being done, done among the Sufis in, uh, I mean, this was what Henry, Henry Corban was uh, so fascinated by the Sufism is because, you know, you, you'd go into a house and, and you'd, everyone would go Shh, like this. And there'd be, uh, uh, you'd see a hundred pairs of shoes outside the house, you know, and then you go in uh, to the room and everyone is lying down there with a cloth over their uh, face. They are, are doing, uh, they're visioning, you know, you know, I mean, and, and this is um, in a uh, talk by Michael Harner. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about shamanism. But this is what the shaman journeys are all about. You know, I mean, you go and you find your wisdom animal and then you talk to him and he takes you on little journeys and you learn things from him, practical things, but also um, things of, of, uh, that have to do with soul. But anyway, um, he became, became friendly with Dante Rossetti and in his wife's bio, biography, uh, said that he was offered a lot of university teaching posts, which he, he couldn't uh, take because of his health. Um, but he had a lively life of dreams and visions, which he called the green life. You know, 
And he was so closely connected with nature uh, for which he cherished a great love, it, this, his dream life. Uh, it, it came into um, its own during his annual trips to the sea and to the mountains in Scotland. And in his, uh, he, he was, he, I think he lived in London, but he was from Scotland. And in his boyhood, who had a Scottish nurse um, had made him familiar with Gaelic legends. Uh, and Scotland seemed to him the home for the soul. soul. That's what Scotland seemed to him. I think that's true of Ireland too, Annette. It's a home for the soul. So he started writing a Celtic uh, novel called uh, Ferre, and he became a, a, aware, it's spelled P-H-A-R-A-I-S. He became aware as he wrote of the predominance of the feminine element in it. Uh, and uh, much of the book uh, owes its uh, inception to the developing, coming into consciousness of the feminine side of his nature. And so he decided to publish uh, the book under the name of Fiona McLeod. That's a woman's name, Fiona. And a name uh, just, she, he said, just appeared in his mind. And he wrote a number of other books under the same name. And uh, the book vividly renders special character of Scotland and its inhabitants. Because it's written by the anima of the earth and this anima of Scotland. You know, it's, it's she's, she's writing it. His, his feminine uh, uh, mu or some, and, and wait till you hear that. Uh, due to the awakening of a new interest in Celtic uh, things, he, it was very well received. Now, William Butler Yeats, said uh, that no, and by the way, William Butler Yeats knew William Sharp and he knew Fiona, uh, read Fiona McLeod and he knew they were the same person. He liked Fiona, but not Sharp so much, you know, but they're really two people. They really are. This is, this is what the point of the whole story is, um, that uh, no new uh, voice is more distinctive, or mysterious or remarkable than the voice revealing itself in uh, the uh, 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 in the uh, literature of Fiona McLeod, voices of simple people and elemental things, um, and uh, he says uh, then too, um, it was not just by observation that he wrote this book, um, but identification with nature. Because he identified with nature, he was speaking. Nature was speaking, not him. Because he had become, he had become lesser, and now nature had become uh, the consciousness within him. This lumen and matura. The the art of these stories uh, uh, was uh, was rested on revelation. Yates said, dealt with invisible, ungraspable things. It's sort of like haiku. You know, I mean, I thought of haiku when I when I read that, and he asked why he wrote under a woman's name. He says, "I can write out of my heart that way, in a way I could never do as William Sharp." And there was this, uh, and there this rapt sense wrote out of my heart. That's not a uh, figure of speech. He's literally writing out of not here. You know, he's writing um, what, what um, you know, Hillman says unites body and spirit or mind or whatever is the metaphor of soul. And this is the voice of the anima. You know, all these images come up are the voice of, of, the, uh, of the archetype of life. That's the anima, the archetype of life. So... Anyway, um, it was this, uh, there was this rapt sense of oneness with nature, a cosmic ecstasy and elation, a, a way, wayfarer along the extreme verges of the common world. 
He had become a wayfarer along the extreme verges of the common world. And it was uh, all uh, uh, mixed up with the, with the romance of being alive. And I could never bring to expression that with my outer self. And he made a close secret of who Fiona McLeod was. In fact, most people didn't know it till he died in 1905. I think he was born 1855. So he would have been 50, I think. Died fairly young. Wrote letters uh, to readers under the name of Fiona McLeod because he had a naturality became two persons, absolutely distinct. Um, in fact, he wrote letters to Fiona and she would answer them. Now that is pretty uh, impressive. And so here the inner anima attained a rare degree of reality. It, this corresponds to what um, uh, we speak of when we, we uh, speak of relating to integrating the anima. And it's surely possible to all, everyone, you know. Now she's gonna, um, you, you know, I don't, uh, before we, um, I, I will have to finish some of this stuff next time because it's absolutely, um, you know, mind blowing some of the things she says at the end of the book. But I just wanted to um, uh, tell another act of imagination story that, uh, that she has. Now this is, that was the one of William Sharp. And in fact, you know, now I have to read him. I had never heard of him before. But anyway, this, this was um, a, a Czech fairy tale. It's of a tree nymph who uh, saw that her oak was endangered and she obtained protection from a squire named Croken. And for his service, she um, wants to reward him with a wish. And what does he want? Does he want fame? honor, richness, or happiness in love. You know, which would you pick? Fame, honor, riches, happiness, and love. You know, what he wants instead, his wish is to rest in the shade of her oak tree from the weary marching of war and there from the mouth, her mouth, to learn the lessons of wisdom to the riddles of life, okay, and his wish is granted, and every evening at twilight, uh, he comes to her and rests under uh, the oak tree. They rest, and and then um, they walk together around along the shores of the reedy, uh, reedy shores of a pond, and she instructs the attentive pupil in nature's secrets, and taught him. Um, uh, the uh, essence of things, and they're um, they're both their natural and their magical qualities. Now, remember, Young says what the ancients call magic, we call psyche. Okay, and that uh, and that is this uh, visionary uh, aspect. Uh, the genuine awareness, you know, I mean, I just think that's so uh, wonderful what Hillman calls it, you know, visioning, uh, being involved in the soul. This is, this is the genuine awareness uh, outside Plato's uh, allegory of the cave. You know, I mean, that, that, that's what she is talking with him about. And because that, what what is the what is genuine awareness is um, is this uh, aspect of uh, yeah here it is let me show you. see what he's saying is our culture our outer awareness is here these people who were imprisoned in the cave uh, chained here and are watching the shadows on the wall that are produced by this fire, you know. Now that's because they are focused on what's highly valued by ego, you know, uh, the, uh, their uh, freedom of choice, the light of ego, solving problems, 
testing reality. Is it real? Did it really happen? Let's get a fact checker. You know, uh, strengthening ego, developing ego, controlling the outer world, and progress. Where the this realm up here, this is where we came from. Up here, this is our source. This is this is the land of the fairy hills. This is the uh, source of life, the archetype of life. You know, and uh, it is um, what what is genuine awareness. Now, this this is the aspect that is worthless and rejected by the ego. And it is the anima, the neglected anima, uh, the feminine energies, soul, inner world, the wisdom of nature, and its visions, the images of the unconscious, uh, uh, dream images, any genuine content of the unconscious. Young called the, uh, the collective unconscious the realm of images. He called where we go after we die the realm of images, you know, because it is, is just all of these, uh, this is where um, the images of dream come from that are put into a uh, thing. And remember, you, you will dream like, uh, uh, you know, Gary, you know, recently has been having dreams about wearing a mask. Okay, that exists in the realm of images now. So the realm of images is always uh, developing. You know, and uh, um, we'll t we'll talk about that. There's three aspects to um, communi to to communicating with the unconscious. One to be where it's there, it's real. Two is to is to have a dialogue with it. And the third aspect is both you and the other world change after that dialogue. And the dialogue can be a painting. The dialogue can be any type of, uh, of um, uh, connection, any type of interrelationship with an image. And then, you know, in alchemy, what the word meditation means is an inner dialogue with a, uh, a dialogue with an inner being, you know, uh, but um, reflection. Now, this is something Marion Mary Woodman mentions is um, at the end of the day, you write your day as if it was a poem. Or at the end of the week, you write your week as if it was a poem. You know, I mean, you reflect on what happened. And then this is insight, mirroring, holding, cooking, brooding, digesting, echoing, and deepening. Now, that is the awareness of the of the uh, what Hillman calls genuine awareness you know but anyway that is what um this uh this squire who uh who uh, uh saved the the oak uh learned you know now um we still have a few minutes left um I might as well go into this uh uh, that was kind of the major thing, the story aspect. So um, any questions? And then uh, maybe I'll just, we can finish up with a little bit on the, uh, uh, till 11.45, and then we'll open for discussion. But if any comments or anything? I've got a comment. Um, and it's, you know, so, for example, in the dialoguing, it's, you know, any type of interrelationship with an image. And yet, with, uh, you know, with symbols, you know, these things are things that come from the unconscious and which can't be tied back to, you know, like any particular object or, you know, or a single meaning. And I'm just wondering, you know, what do you see... Uh, would you see dialoguing as forming the symbol or just acting with the symbol? The symbol does not exist in nature. Okay? The symbol is the third thing. Okay? It's the philosopher's stone. It is that aspect that is created by the dialogue. 
could not possibly exist. Does it can't be found in nature? It is it is created, and and the only symbol that really matters now are the ones you create. Okay, and and this the uh, um, so what do you think about that, Gary? What what is um, what, oh, I really some, like it, you know, because I was trying to, you know, I was trying to tie it together. I was like, well, wait, you know, because the, you know, so yeah, that that works very well for tying the dialogue together with the symbol and it being the dialogue, you know, being the formation of the symbol or maybe just working with the symbol. Yeah, I mean, this this is from uh, the Lexicon of Alchemy by uh, Rulandus. And uh, he, here's what meditation is. The name of an internal talk of one person with another who is invisible, as in the invocation of a deity. And I would say that would be a daemon. This was, this was written, I think, in 11 or maybe like the 14th or 15th or 16th century. So it's very old. Uh, or communion with one's self or with one's good angel. That's what alchemical meditation is. Okay, this is lying down in dark places. This is shaman journey. You know, I mean, basically it's it's all that. And, you know, one thing, uh, the more I've been getting in is, you know, I did analysis for about 14 years and been reading a lot of young but I really never got it. In fact, I can't even really do analysis anymore because of the fact that um, what you what you find in your active imagination is too beautiful and too precious to really be exposed to the outer world. You know, I mean, because it really happens. I mean, if you can soften yourself up enough to do it, now you don't have to. I, I've always kind of tried to do visioning, you know, just because I'm a daredevil, you know, but the easy way to do active imagination is just to do uh, any kind of a meditation, which, um, uh, what is that, that la basement du niveau, you know, you just uh, lower the harsh light of consciousness, okay, and uh, then you just ask questions. And Hillman says, you shouldn't too often ask questions about practical things. You, know, you should really ask questions about, I mean, you can do it, but he's not too sure about the quality of the answer. <laughs> okay. You can do that through an e throwing a I Ching too, you know, but, but the idea of, of uh, the real power of the act of imagination is not how do I arrange my outer world better? You know, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to make the unconscious contents conscious. And uh, this, this was, this is, by the way, the last three or four pages of uh, this uh, anima are, are talk about is, uh, is this. So this is the real purpose of active imagination is that genuine awareness not to help you out with the cave awareness so much you know that that's not the uh they're not interested in that and by the way they're very flighty you know if they're very uh, they are they're the nat natural uh tendency of these inner figures that what they expect from us is complete neglect that's what they get from us, is complete neglect. Now, that's, uh, they, they aren't very happy with that, okay? Because they're real, by the way, you know? And they don't like it. And uh, uh, if you uh, don't, um, uh, you, you know, if, this, this is the whole idea of, of the revenge aspect of the elves, elves, they're being ignored. You know, go ahead, Miles. 
Oh, wow. Um, so a quick question, Lumen Natura, how's that spelt? Okay, uh, L-U-M-E-N, it means light. And then, now, could we say that Lumen Natura is a diamond? It is, um, Lumen Natura is the, um, is the light of nature. So could and we say that Lumen Natura is Mother Earth? It is her wisdom. Because I just, I, I purchased uh, a little while ago a program from James Hollis called Creating a Life. And he says, he said uh, in the session I listened yes to, to yesterday, he said, nature doesn't give a fig about you. So I'm thinking, well, when he says nature, we could also be talking this Lumen Natura, and it really is in keeping with what you just said, that um, the inner figures expect and get complete neglect from us, and they're not very happy about that. And you also previously said Lumen Natura is an educator and we are her pupils and need to listen. And I'm thinking, you know, an educator to a degree doesn't give a fig about us, right? We are expected to show up, listen. And if we don't, we're going to get an F, you know, we're going to get that big failed F on our paper, you know? So um, uh, what am I driving at? Well, I guess just, it just makes a lot of sense. And uh, well, I no. think what he, what he's saying that nature there's two aspects of nature. There is is the one that um, produces species, okay. And they always say it doesn't care about the the individual members in a species. All it cares about is the species itself, you know. And the way it strengthens it is the ones who can't make it fall off to the side. You know, and uh, uh, one of one of uh, some comments, like in in Desmond Morris, in the Naked Ape that he wrote, you know, that because infant mortality has decreased so much, he didn't expect there to be a lot of development um, in 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 shaping bodies. But you know what's what's really amazing to me is each generation's taller, better looking, and and stronger than the generation before. And here, here's another thing, you know, um, the, uh, if you look at skulls in the British Isles before there was uh, um, agriculture, before there was bread, there's no um, overbite, you know, the, uh, the lower jaw and the upper jaw just meet perfectly. But then after, uh, flour started to be made, the lower jaw got smaller and and there was a lot of more, up, seemed to be more overbite. What, what I'd like to just follow up and say, you know, I'm, when I look, looked at the image of the cave and then getting out of the cave and into the, you know, the beauty of the genuine awareness, it reminds me of, you know, of bears. Um, a mother bear returns to the den and, and has the cubs and the cubs are you know in that environment and they're progressing but at some point the uh, mother bear will you know uh, it sort of doesn't give a fig anymore about the cubs and, and has to growl and scare those bears out of the cave and off onto their own into the world you know so sorry mm -hmm. for the dog next door but um and in a sense, uh, you know, as an as a parent, the, the same thing happens to a degree. You know, if you have if you have your kids and they're still clinging around the nest, you almost have to bark at them to say, "Get out there, get some genuine awareness." Well, there there's some uh, something to that, but you you know, let's you have to get out of the nest, and and that's usually in the first half of life. But where do our dreams come? 
who who produces the things? Okay. Nature produces. It's the most genuine, real thing we have. And it's produced by the lumen natura. It's produced by uh, the archetype of life, which the anima is. Okay. And it is um, the rudder underneath the surface that is steering the boat. Okay. Now, the idea is it's also young, you use the analogy, it's the rhizome, the root, the massive root underneath the earth. And then we're just this little green shoot above the earth. And that what, where did we come from? You know, like when, when I would ask my anima, you know, uh, get rid of this doubt. I'm a little doubting today. And she says, who do you think you are? You know, where did your body come from? Where, where did your, you don't think I'm real? She says, uh, where did, how do you think you see with your eyes and, and talk with you and think with your brain? Who did the ego do that? You know, is that who did it? You know, I mean, and, and the idea uh, it, you find particularly in, um, in uh, images, I think today, of if you ever have a dream about being in a car, you usually are driving it from the back seat or there's some big, big obstacle ahead or you're gonna run off the road or it's going in too fast or it won't start or there's no steering wheel or there's no engine in the thing. I mean, the idea is that you're riding in a vehicle that you are not the master of. This was what Jung found out. You're not the master in your own house. That's the, uh, when you dream about houses, who owns the house? I don't own it, or maybe I do, but maybe I haven't been paying rent or I haven't been paying mortgage payments or, or, you know, I'm, I, I'm here and, and, and I'm not supposed to be here, you know, <laughs> you know, and I have to sneak around the house because I'm afraid that somebody's going to discover me. And anyway, that is again, the, the, the dream telling us that um, it, we are, it's, this, this is what young soul told us, okay, too. You're my projection. I'm not your projection. Okay. You came out of me. I didn't come out of you. You exist in me. I don't exist in you. Okay. You're out here in time and space, my little uh, spacecraft. To find out what you can, uh, and I... So your real role is to let me in to your ego awareness and so that we can unite there and that we can re we can produce what Gary called the symbols and we can evolve consciousness. This was this was a evolution of the lumen natura, the one that produces um, I, I I wanted to, uh, uh, Camilla uh, said yesterday or last time about the uh, uh, about the uh, uh, how, how how great of an engineer nature is, you know, and uh, it just reminded me of this thing uh, that uh, Young uh, said one time is, uh, you know, it seems as if one half of the world. Uh, has been made by an engineer and the other half by a foolish poet. You know, who produced that? You know, and who produced this flower? And who produced this here? The lumen natura did. It, it is, now, now that's, this is who we're dealing with, okay, in the unconscious. The one that produced all this stuff. You know, and uh, uh, who produces your dreams? You know, I mean, this is also so when you're saying that nature doesn't give a fig about you, you are nature. You know, we are nature. We have this uh, third point. This is, what's the difference between a grizzly bear who is sly, clever, wise? Wise means means very um, sagacious about living, about living, you know, and, uh, and uh, you, you know, it is, 
it has all all of the qualities that we have you know you know it's, okay so i'm i'm uh, the wizard of oz and it's got one thing you haven't got you know <laughs> and uh, you know uh, or the a heart or you know like that was what the tin man was missing but what the human being has is this archimedean point which can look back at itself you know and uh, uh, so it's what we are really is what uh, was described um, in uh, uh, turning and turning in a widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. You know, uh, that's who we are. The falconer, we can't hear the falconer anymore. See, the falconer is uh, who we are in service to, but we can't hear him anymore. And that is what our, so the nature doesn't give a fig about us, is, um, um, I don't think, it, now here's the other aspect, is that uh, every time you do a, um, now, okay, let's say we draw a dream, okay? You take a dream and you draw, that's an act of imagination in itself. And it's called, the two things you can do for a dream is the medium of expression. That means you draw the dream and you uh, and you put it into uh, into the um, outer world and then it becomes a numinous thing you look at it and you say oh you know every time I look at that that dreams comes right back to me it's just got this haunting aspect to it you know and uh, um, so at, at that point, um, you know, that's a good act of imagination in itself. You know, here's a, a dream I had. <laughs> there was a huge clerk, click and a great wearing sound and an observatory dome was opening and its telescope emerged, but the telescope and the observatory were pointed downwards, not at the sky into the depths okay you know okay well that's the that's the first aspect of the dream you know the medium of expression you know and then the second aspect is the one of, of what's called the archetype of meaning i mean you just walk around it and you throw words at it you know you use this one now here's the other thing that grizzly bears don't have and the other thing the lumen natura didn't have okay the lumen natura until it got this, um, you sent this uh, uh, maze, this little uh, spaceship out so it could then incarnate in it. The spaceship was supposed to be so it could ride in the spaceship, not you, you know, you're its spaceship, okay? It wants to be in you, okay? And what, what do we have? We're word beings. Everything we think and do is in words, you know, in sentences and subjects and verbs and you know uh and uh and and by the and now the now the lumen Tura has a little different um uh has 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 more tools in its toolbox because it now it can um in our dreams it uses voice you know not just images you know i think that bears dogs snakes have pretty much the same dreams we do, but they don't have words. In them. And they're also not, okay, now this, I, I do wanna, um, I'm gonna to read this one part at, at the end here um, about the archetypes, you know, the archetypes, uh, what, what is it they're really uh, uh, after? You know, they seem to have a goal. The archetypes, just like the instincts have a goal, the archetypes have a goal. And what is that goal? You know, I mean, the, the goal of, of the, um, it's um, uh, the, this, uh, she, he says um, that uh, the, this, she's talking about Young's dream about the bird. It, it, it um, shows uh, the feminine wants admission to the dreamer's house. The white bird wants uh, admission to uh, the dreamer's house, young. 
but it is still a child and it's undeveloped. So it becomes a bird again. And it, it's, it's the first clear appearance of the anima figure in this person's uh, um, dreams, young. And it, it, it is, is emerging to the threshold of consciousness, but is only half human as yet. Now, this is, this, this is the swan maidens, the water beings. They're only half human. So is, and this is a dream very much like the swan maidens that Jung had. The unconscious has not only a tendency, has, a, has not only a tendency to persist in its primal space, state, but sim, sometimes to engulf and extinguish what has already been made conscious. So uh, that's why it, it reverts to its animal form. But um, here it shows plain signs of activity in the opposite direction. And the unconscious contents are struggling to become conscious. And like elves, they revenge themselves if they're not um, taken uh, into account, if we ignore them. The urge towards increased consciousness uh, seemingly proceeds from the archetypes. The anima is the archetype of life. Okay? The animus is the archetype of meaning. Okay, And it's like uh, the archetypes are like an instinct tending towards a goal. And it's the, one of the great undiscovered secrets of the psyche uh, end of life. This urge towards increased consciousness expressed in the desire of a creature still bound to nature, this is the, an, the archetype of life, the anima is half human, uh, still bound to nature, no, only half human, to approach a human being and to be accepted by him. And that means to become conscious. That means to become conscious of your dreams and then to draw a picture of them and then to throw uh, words at the metaphors and try to figure out what they mean. They, it, she is, um, the, these uh, archetypes are elemental beings uh, and, uh, and she, now she's gonna go take a little bit of a tangent, but they um, often possess a more or less hidden father. Okay. Now, in this case of Young's dream, he can only come when the male dove is busy with the 12 dead. Now, <laughs> what does that mean? You know, it's a very interesting image. I don't care what it means. It's, it's just interesting enough. We don't need to know. Okay. And um, that's, the, that's its father. Okay. It's a child. The Valkyries are Odin's maidens. And Odin was the god of wind and spirit. And uh, um, there was one um, dream, I don't know if we talked about it, where this man becomes in love with this girl and he, um, he comes and offers her a piece of, of bread, holds it out to her. She's combing her hair in the, uh, in the depths. Uh, I mean, on, on the surface of the water. Uh, let me see if I can have a picture of that. Find it. Uh, well, I'm not sure, but in, anyway, this this is a very common image of the uh, of the uh, water being sitting on the surface of the water and uh, combing her hair, you know, and uh, she is. Uh, oh, here it is. Here it is. Okay. Okay, she's, she's sitting on the surface of the water combing her hair. And so, and she's the most beautiful woman this man's ever seen. And he comes over and offers her a piece of bread. And uh, nope, I don't want that. And then he tries to grab her and she goes under the water. And so then he comes back the next day and his mother told him, told uh, her, him to give her dough, un, unbaked dough. And so then he tries to say, no, she doesn't want that either. And she dives under 
And then the next day, he comes with half baked bread. Okay. So it's halfway between dough and, and baked bread. And yes, she even offers her hand to him. And she says that she'll marry him uh, if he comes back the next day. So next day he comes back. And then she, um, she, uh, her father comes up. And there's two of her. And you, you can't tell which is her. And her father said that you could um, have, uh, she, he could marry her if he can tell which is which. You know, he has to have discernment. Okay. And uh, uh, he, um, he told by the way she tied her shoes, which one it was. And uh, uh, so he got, he got her. So anyway, it's just this um, idea of the, uh, that it often has a unknown or hidden father. Well, uh, Gary, why don't I turn it over to you and uh, let's just get a, if we can, get a comment from everybody about uh, either this or any other questions you have about anything. You know, go ahead, Gary. I will mute myself. Yeah. Um, why don't we go ahead and go around? Um, you know, before we do, though, on the archetypes, so. They often have a father. Is that because an archetype represents like a particular aspect and it isn't fully human? So there has to be something which is beyond it. Is that the idea? Well, I think it, it, it's the organizing principle behind the archetype. Now, one thing we want to finish with. Uh, for instance, most um, cultures used to be set up on the the uh, on, on matriarchal. Um, you, you know how you would how you would make sure there was no inbreeding in a uh, in a tribe. Usually, that um, the uh, uh, you, you you know the the you you would be the 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 fathers all came from some other tribe. So the most important member, a male member, was not your father. It was your, uh, your mother's brother, the uncle, okay? You know, because he was of the kin, you know. All these fathers that came from the other tribes were not of the kin. So they really didn't have a lot of say. So this, this was, I think this is the same aspect here, is that it would be the father of the daughter who is the brother of the mother, okay? So it isn't really the, this, um, uh, you know, spiritual uh, father. It is, it is a, it is um, what, it would be more Pan-like, more Dionysian, you know, it would be, not be so Apollonian. It would be very closely allied with nature, the hidden father. Because the anima, the archetype of life, is in need of the spiritual father, the archetype of meaning. The archetype of life is plenty wise all by itself. But to have the archetype of life uh, evolve or have the God image evolve, uh, it, it has to become conscious. And one of the aspects of developing this outer consciousness of the archetype of life in us is through the archetype of meaning. What does this mean? You know, and then it becomes more. So the two things we do with dreams, one is the uh, being the medium of expression of it, either through dancing or writing a poem about it or singing or drawing or painting. And, and then the other aspect is the archetype of meaning. And together they create what you were talking about, Gary, the symbol. So yeah, the archetype uh, of life has a, 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 a element in it which is related to the uh, father, but I think the father is the son of the great mother. So okay, you know, so, you know, you brought up 
the painting which you had made of your dream with the upside down observatory. And so within your dream, that would be, you know, a symbol, right? That, that you could now dialogue with. Would you agree? An image that I could dialogue with. And after I dialogued with it, there would be a symbol that came up. Okay. It would become a symbol because I would have added meaning to it. So it doesn't become a symbol until you add meaning. Yeah, it needs to become the third thing, you know. See, first of all, the image. I mean, when you see your dreams in your raw form, what in the hell is this? You don't know. But once you start to um, add libido to it, and libido is our attention, and talk about it, and then draw it and run, and then say, well, what does it mean for a, a, a planetary observatory to be... Uh, upside down in the sky with its telescope pointed down to earth. What does that mean? Okay, so then you start to talk about what it means. And suddenly when, I, I always call this the blessed hour, when you're doing this, you feel soul with you. And she'll help you get the answers. You know? And then, then you say, well, um, you, you know that the, the upper world should be observing the depths, not the lower world observing. You, what you, Craig, are in need of is for your upper world to observe the depths, not to observe the celestial realms, but to look down at the earth. Focus your attention downward into the depths. Okay, so then that, at that point, and not until then, suddenly an upside down observatory is a symbol to me, you know? And uh, I would put it on my, one of my stained glass windows in, in my uh, temple of wisdom, which is the philosopher's stone. You know, this is this, the philosopher's stone. See, the, the, the problem is the, the, uh, the consciousness can never enter the invisible world. And the invisible world can never enter the outer world. So where do they meet? They meet in the third place in the symbol. That is a real meeting. That is a real union. And that's the philosopher's stone. It's the temple of wisdom. And it does not occur in nature. That's what the alchemists all say. It does not occur in nature. Ego can't produce it all by itself. Nature can't produce it all by itself. The only way that it can come into being is through the, the, the joint efforts of ego and nature. The archetype of life. Okay, one more question, and then we'll go around. But uh, this is really helping. So where would the archetype be in that dream? And how would that relate? Okay. Well, um, the the archetype of life in that dream is the is I think is the rudder, you know, is the steering mechanism of me, of the ego consciousness, and it is trying to to tell me that I, in my outer world activities, need to make course correction. This is the archetype of life speaking to me. And the course correction I need to do is to stop looking upward and outward and to start looking inward and into the depths. And by the way, I just want to say, this is something I really learned. What is it? This is something I learned just recently. What does it mean to descend? To go downstairs? To, uh, to, to do an act of magic? Where are we going? And where are the depths? They're the body. There are what you call our little earth. You know, that's our little earth. And so where does the light of nature that Miles is talking about come from? From our body. Where do the dreams come? They come from the marrow of our bones, from our cells, from our blood vessels. You should also always, when you're talking with inner figures, I think it's a good idea to talk with your feet. 
talk with your legs and talk with your uh, hands and with your eyes and your heart and your heart. You know, ask them how they're doing and then talk to the body itself and ask them. But anyway, I'm sorry, I, I got off a little bit there, Gary. No, that was, uh, that was all great. So, uh, Miles, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so much, so rich. Thinking of the symbol, uh, well, uh, Craig, symbol doesn't exist in nature, but symbols have elements of nature. And I'm thinking of Ireland, and I believe Ireland is the land of the harp. And I, maybe Annette can correct me if I'm wrong, but does Ire mean harp? And, and what is a harp? It's wood and it's cat gut. Um, in Canada, we have the Canadian flag, which I've been really contemplating, meditating on uh, as a symbol. It has a maple leaf in the middle uh, between two rectangular bars and its color is red. So um, thoughts on that, Craig? Symbols, not uh, yeah. in nature, but created from elements of it. Okay, well, they're Primarily is um, there is a symbol is only really relevant if to it, uh, nowadays. Okay, it used to be that we would go to the church and they our symbols were uh, the cross, uh, the the uh, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the the virgin birth the um uh you know the um giving the uh, uh bread to taking a loaf and feeding five thousand and and baptism and things like that now those are all very powerful symbols you know every time i say and i i defy or the mass i defy anyone not to it, particularly that with christmas music the birth of life not not to be somewhat moved by those images you know i mean i i the the but they're they, they are symbols that still work in us because they're really in our dna to some extent because i i really think symbols change dna okay a little bit so so when you're when you're seeing some symbol that helps shape you you know uh, a little uh is something resonates in you, whether you believe it or not. Okay, I don't think it makes a difference if you believe it or not. But it does. There are some that resonate. I mean, you start. You're, you're driving down uh, the road and you turn uh, this way. I've had this. Uh, and there's three crosses uh, at dusk on a hill. You know, I mean, it's startling. Okay, you know, to see that now. Those are symbols. Now, uh, there, there's a difference between a sign and a symbol, okay? A symbol is a, a, an element of transforming consciousness, okay? Transforming us from the outer world to a being who has leaves on both sides of its tree. It is not all its leaves just in the outer world. It has leaves in the inner world too, you know? But I, and nowadays, uh, the, you know, Young said, unless you're a Catholic, because Catholics seem to still um, get, get a lot out of their religion. And we mentioned, I think that's because they are so, um, they don't have any words. Not a, a, It's particularly before they um, went to um, having uh, things in English. You know, when everything was in Latin, you just went there for the ceremony and for the rituals. And it was incredibly mysterious and incredibly moving, you know. But it was really, uh, uh, because there was no words, it became sort of an act of imagination. And they, by the way, they used to put those little, uh, what do they call those round uh, meditation walks that you would do? You know, there's one in chart, you know. Uh, 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 there's a word for them, I can't remember. Labyrinth. labyrinth. Yeah, a labyrinth. There's the labyrinth. And, and, and you would you would walk the labyrinth and you would take your um your uh meditation beads. There was a lot of meditation 
uh, tradition in Catholicism. But if you're uh, if you were thrown out of that into this place where you go to a church and some guy who's had two years of seminary school talks to you for 45 minutes and then passes the offering plate there, you know, and he just, you know, it's just all uh, blah, 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 you know. I mean, you don't have any idea what he's saying. There's no ritual, very little, you know. Then you're a little, you feel lost, you know. What, what is this all about, you know? But uh, anyway, the, um, I, I think the, uh, uh, can, can you say that again, Miles? I kind of forgot what the question was. Well, I was just saying that the um, uh, symbol is not, doesn't exist in nature. We create it as our, um, whether it's a, a harp or a song, I suppose. And we create these things out of our dreams, out of our soul, out of the meditatio, the, the internal talk of one person with another who is invisible as in an invocation of the deity or a diamond. I wrote that, quoted you there. I just to summarize, uh, you know, creating a life by James Hollis, this program where he said, mm -hmm. nature doesn't give a fig about you. It just means, uh, you know, I'm just Be giving a sound bite. That statement. Yeah. yeah, it's a sound bite. It's, so it's, I uh, don't want confusing. people, it's a bit confusing, but what it, does tell us is that you know we have a moment in this time and space continuum that uh, nobody gets out alive you know but i'm not saying that there's death but we'll be transformed and so um, i really liked what you said wise means being sagacious about life which i furthered with means going to depth see the cave awareness, see the genuine awareness, individuate and participate with wisdom, knowledge plus love, meaning plus life, animus plus anima, for harmony or at least cooperation. Thank you. Yeah, wisdom is about life. Knowledge is about facts, you know. Uh, and uh, so it's not, no. But I, I just, when you were saying that, I just love this uh, idea of the labyrinth. Uh, Ariadne discovers her lover, lover Theseus disappears in the night, leaving her on the island of Naxos alone. And the god Dionysus then appears and takes her by the ear and whispers, but thou hast small ears, but thou hast my ears. Put a cunning word in, I am thy labyrinth. Now, the idea there is one of active imagination, okay? The labyrinth in Chartres Cathedral is an act of imagination. Who walks, now you, you taught Gary about the slow fox walk or what is it you call it? Yes. That's a meditation. That is a internal talk, you know? It is a uh, active imagination when you do something like that. I think the same thing of Tai Chi, uh, what you know, the, if you're ever in San Francisco and you go to the wharf in Sunday morning, you'll see all these people out there, you know, doing this. You know, why are they doing that? You know, I mean, it is really an active imagination. You know, it is a internal talk with someone in the invisible realms. But anyway, Carrie, why don't you keep going? Will? Yeah, uh, Nick, you want to make a comment? <laughs> Yeah, I was just um, wondering about this anima symbol that I'm personally following, mm -hmm. and um, and I I love to, to read about the fairy tales of Marie Louise from France. It's really helpful, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. And um, but for me, it's like a discovery journey. Like it's it's um, it has so many layers and. One of them is, is coming through more or less to ancestors. And then there's the symbol two fathers. And then it, it keeps changing. And, um, and, um, and recently now I've, I've discovered um, uh, one of them is connected to the early people in Ireland. And, um, and the difference between the travelers, the traveling people and 
the Gaelic people that were living there and uh, mm. they were two different tribes. And it's just ongoing with those symbols, isn't it? It's mm, yes. layer after layer after layer, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. I mean, I, after I got re done reading this, and by the way, which one did you read, Annette? Why don't we just do that one next week? Did you read one from Anonymous Fairy Tale? The Marie Louise von Franz, I, the one you sent me. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just do Anonymous Fairy Tale next time. I'll, I'll find out one and, and we'll do it uh, next time. But yes, there is just, it is an incredible realm. There is, yeah. it's bottomless. It yes. is absolute, this, this is the whole idea of the imaginal world, okay? okay. You, know, you think that, that means it's not true. No, the word comes from magnify, okay? okay. It means to expand consciousness. So if yeah. you are doing active imagination, you are actively expanding your consciousness. Oh, now, yeah. Yeah, what von Franz says about the fairy tales is that they are are so now now you see that, um, remember you told about the um, about the the silkies who oh, yeah. never have a successful resolution. Okay, and she talks about that too at the end of this book. She says that's because. The consciousness will not let the swan in. So, okay. Yeah, the consciousness is not going to give up its thing. The only way that it could happen was for Angus to become a swan. Yes. It is not possible for the swan to become Angus. Okay, I see. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, if the swan does not become Angus, then you can't. But uh, she's going to be gone. It's not going to last. Okay. But yes, the, the whole idea is it's layers and layers. And layers. layers. Yes. Yeah. It's mercurial, okay? Yeah. Meta Ovid's metamorphoses. It's ever changing. You know, like, like um, uh, was it uh, Heracles that said that, you know, the, the, uh, the river that we look at is never the same, you know, because it's mm. always flowing by. But the, the idea is life is becoming thing. And if you ever find an image that is frozen and is not ever kaleidoscopically changing, you know, mm -hmm. it's dead. Wow. It's not alive. You know, mm -hmm. it needs to be forever changing. So the symbols that I had a year ago, maybe they don't work today. Mm -hmm. You know? They were, it's all process, okay? Now, that's also a very feminine energy process. The, you know, Jung says that when you're on the journey, the journey is your goal. Wow, yeah, yeah. There is no place you're going, you know. Mm. When you're on the journey, the journey is the goal. And that, I think, is this idea of layers and layers and layers. But they're all so beautiful. There's nothing. Yes. They're all absolutely fascinating. Yes, exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. But let's let's do an animus dream next time, and then uh, by von Franz, it might take us. She writes forty pages on one fairy tale, so it might take us a couple couple sessions. But we'll okay. bring in some of the Hillman and the other uh, uh, to uh, supplement it. Yeah, and I was going to respond to Miles the Harp, what I believe is linked to the old stories in Ireland, um, Mora Rua, but I can, um, I can look it up what exactly the details are, but I think it's something like that, like, um, the Red Mary story. Mm -hmm. uh, Orpheus, and uh, that's, uh, he brings uh, uh, the, his, uh, the woman that's trapped in the underworld up with the uh, harp and you know one of the images that young really liked was of the aeolian harp. You know? okay. this is yeah this is the harp that is played by the wind you know i mean it's, it's just a beautiful harp you know? so, anyway cool. thank you miles yeah. right you know just one one quick comment on that you know you said how the swan cannot become us you know we have to become 
the swan. I think, and that also relates back to, you know, to what you said earlier about observation versus identification. You know, if we observe, then we're standing outside of ourselves and, it, and you know, the, the perception doesn't, doesn't take root. Well, it doesn't, you know, become, but if, if we can do the identification where we become permeable, where, where, you know, the, the ego drops, that's, you know, that's, I think that's why it works. That, that's the, and again, this is just one other aspect of, of the, of the um, layers and layers is the cornucopia, you know, this, this little, this conduit from the outer world that just pours forth a uh, uh, bounty into the, into the outer world, you know, and it's so, so when you have become or identified with nature and, and not just observing nature, then you open up the layers and layers, you open up the conduit that just pours forth. And uh, at that point, you will, William Butler Yeats will tell you that he likes your poetry. But anyway, uh, I, uh, did you want to go to Azin there? I think Azin. Yeah, have... Azin, go ahead. I just want to say hi to you all and uh, tell you that how I enjoy it. All you were saying about symbols and um, the way you look at the symbols and the transformation from image to symbol. And um, images and uh, Mundus Imaginalis is my favorite uh, subject. So um, I'm quite familiar with um, Henry Corbin and Sora Vardi, Ibn Arabi. And what I um, wrote in the comments was about a book um, Sora Vardi wrote in 12th century. Mm -hmm. The whole book, it's a very small, thin book, but it's all a continuous active imagination. So it mm -hmm. starts from him being uh, waking up in a dream in a mosque and he saw this uh, figure all uh, dressed in red and it's all conversations with this figure and it goes on and on. So I just wanted to add uh, what you said that active imagination is an ancient thing. It's not, oh. uh, yeah. Well, you know, Peter Kingsley uh, would go to, to Iran and to Turkey uh, just to, because the, the tradition is still alive there. Uh, yeah. This, uh, this ancient uh, tradition that Henry Corbin, uh, you know, uh, was so fascinated by, you know, and uh, it is, it is, is uh, sort of the uh, underground uh, 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 naturally occurring, organically developing uh, mythic world. That's where it's occurring. Is in every the child. Every child does it, right? Yes. Well, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, it, it is. I mean, this this is what uh, I think so fascinates Miles about the um, the uh, n the indigenous peoples of Canada are doing pretty much the same thing. You know, they, these are the living myths, okay? Yeah. The ones that, that see, you know, the problem is active imaginations uh, are not like script where you write it down, it's frozen in, ter in, in the page. And if you change one letter, we have to throw the whole thing out, start over. No, this, this the, the, the idea is before there was writing, you yeah. know, uh, how did myths develop? They developed through the oral tradition, you know, and this is really what I think Henry, Henry Corban is, is talking about, an oral tradition that is still alive in Persia and in uh, some parts of Turkey, you know, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm not sure about Syria or any other Iraq. I mean, remember the woman of Basra? I don't know if you ever read, she, she'd say, I am the drinker, I am the cup, and I am the wine. Yeah. Now, isn't that a beautiful uh, act? I was, raised, I was raised in a Sufi um, family. So my mm -hmm. childhood is um, about just picturing, um, just me uh, looking through the window and this whirling dervishes <laughs> dancing oh, yes. 
My grandparents, they were both dervishes. So yeah, no. I come from that tradition. It's uh, very close to my heart. And well, it, uh, is. It, it gives a, a, um, a much deeper, in my opinion, it, is, um, it takes a um, leap uh, in depth psychology because you, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of more contemplation on the meaning and uh, this merge, this emergence of Western and Eastern minds. Um, yes, it is. A wonderful blending of the Hindu tradition, the a tradition of, of Persia, and of some of the Western that has come in through trade routes, you know, and even uh, it, it, the idea. Now, the whirling dervish is very much uh, like uh, the... Um, the labyrinth. Now, how does the labyrinth have anything to do with uh, with Christianity? I mean, and and the whirling dervish. I mean, this is just such a beautiful uh, act of imagination. I mean, I don't know how you could have anything. What is the purpose of it? You know, I mean, there is no purpose. It if you if you say there's a purpose, then you have broken the spell because it has a spell to it that um, that is uh, you don't want to mess with, you know, I mean, because it's not to be put into a, a sentence with a period at the end, you know, like any uh, art is. If you're going to do anything, you can just write a poem about it, you know, but it's this, this aspect. I, I, I just really envy you, uh, as in, <laughs> being able to grow up with that, I mean, because it's just the beauty of it is inexpressible, you know. Yeah. But, what I what I witnessed was a bit wilder than this. This is um, a performance mostly for tourists, mm -hmm. and nowadays um, they plan these sessions. They have these meetings to do the dance and stuff. But originally, um, what happens, for example, to Rumi was that he was coming with these poems. And the dance happened. There was no goal. He, there was no intention setting a session. It was it just happened in the middle of the marketplace, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, say the word "rumi" and nothing else needs to be said. <laughs> and he is uh, uh, just an absolute gift, you know. But well, thank you. Uh, where exactly? Can you tell us generally where you're from, Azin? I'm from Iran, but I'm currently living in um, Sacramento. Okay, great. Well, fabulous. It's, uh, welcome. Hope you come you. back. As, uh, we'd love uh, to have you every time. So Sure, sure. I back. really, really enjoyed this session. Thank you. Great. So, uh, share. Camelia, do you have uh, any comments? Um, I'm just catching up with the, all the, the reading, which I have read bits off in other contexts, but it's really nice to read it in sort of in one go. And like uh, you said, Craig, earlier, the, the Hillman writing is, is fabulous, I think. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that uh, I really like the way he sort of uh, engages with it. And uh, especially the sort of part that... Um, that doesn't divide the anima and animus into gender, but that it's actually issues for each of us, uh, men or women, that it's like an even more objective thing that really uh, sparked my imagination. And I, I understood certain things about sort of relationships in general that I thought he just put really well. Yeah, so thank you. And nice to listen to you, your talking and your questioning and speaking all the rest of you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Christina, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, you can unmute Christina. You could just introduce yourself, but you don't have to. There's no requirement. You can just, uh, if you have anything to say, you might don't want to speak. You can put it in the chat, but um, go ahead. And I know uh, Don doesn't usually say anything, but if you have anything to say, Don, go ahead or put it in the chat. 
And then I think we just have uh, Cheryl left, but, I, but she's on the phone. I'm not sure if you can unmute on the phone or not. If you if you have anything though, Cheryl, and if you can unmute, go ahead. Okay, so Don said no, and yeah. I'm not. Oh, great, Cheryl, go ahead. Hi, this is the first one that I of your seminars that I've been to. Thank you so much. Um, I did not realize how much um, Jung was involved in stuff like this, um, and the elementals. Um, you know, I know some people that really believe in them. Um, and I'm not saying that I do. I'm not saying that I don't. I'm really not sure because I've never seen them. But that young put the time and the energy in it. Um, I think there's an energy there for sure. And what it is, I'm not 100% certain of, but I thought that was very interesting. So on the elementals, I mean, and this is just me, it might be interesting to hear other people's takes on this, but if like, if I do like a, a meditation or an act of imagination where, you know, something like that pops up, you know, like an animal or an elemental, then I just acquire, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to presume that was there for a purpose. So I'm going to call it, you know, like one of my you know, spirit animals or whatever. And so then when I do uh, an act of imagination, you know, I always begin with something where, you know, I ask these things for their help at the outset. And, um, you know, and, and also I think just to show humility and to, to, to make sure that I don't go in there egocentric, but rather that I'm trying to get everything its own autonomous being. And by, you know, giving things their own autonomy, you know, you, you get more into the, uh, you know, into the identification uh, rather than the observation. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, well, I would say uh, one thing, Cheryl, is that the idea of do you see like uh, one woman, you know, her house was cleaned every night by the brownies and uh, she uh, uh, puts a... Uh, she, she, she's just so curious, she can't help it. So she puts flour, you're never supposed to see the brownies. And so she puts flour on the floor so she could see their little webbed feet. And there's little webbed feet all over the flour and they never came back. The, the idea, I think, is of the invisible world. The, the idea of, in Martin Sharp, Sharp's case, he did not write it. Fiona McDon Mc, uh, McLeod wrote it, okay. And, and the idea was he went away. He let this other aspect come in. She, he could have never written those poems. She wrote it. So is she real? He couldn't have written them. So who did write them? His poems, he could never have written his, the poems that Yeats loved so much. And, and so is Fiona McLeod real? I mean, the, the idea is in active imagination is this, you dream while you're awake, okay? So you're, um, you, you, you develop a skill and it's not easy to be able to contact somewhat, and it's usually on a very limited basis, usually not too powerful, some people have it very, Christiana Morgan was one, but um, to dialogue, this is that meditatio with these beings. And Barbara Hanna says, don't worry that you made it up. You know, you say, what does this um, uh, telescope upside down mean? I'm asking an uh, inner figure. Uh, you know, I'd ask a lot of them. Ask my heart, heart. What does the, the upside down telescope mean? And Barbara Hanna says, don't worry that you think you wrote it because you'll find if you do it uh, often enough, you'll find out you could never have written that either. William Sharp said, I could not have written these poems. So 
you are really developing a real voice of wisdom within you. Now, if you don't have to put the flower on the earth to see the, the webbed feet of the brownies to know that. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this this is naive or, or concrete. I'm not quite sure. But I think that everything that we have, the, the myths, the Celtic myths, et cetera, um, the brownies, the elementals, there is some piece of truth or validity, but not necessarily the way we think it is. And um, maybe this is because I have some rather unique uh, experiences, um, such as when my dog that I'm hoping to become a therapy puppy was at the um, trainers and all of a sudden I just saw in my head that there was a problem with the leash and my initial reaction was you're just making that up Cheryl and then I got call her now and um, turns out that she had accidentally dropped the leash now how would I know this miles away when I can't see the dog or when I was um, learning past life regression and in between life regression and I was part of a, a, a triad and the one person in the triad um, her past life was as a crystal um, spirit now, I was not the one working with her oh I really wanted to work with her but the other person that was in the triad just didn't know how to deal with that so although I wasn't actually working with her I was the one writing down all the questions because I wrote down to the other woman you know would you like to some help and it was oh yes so I was writing down all the questions that she was asking to get more information and then um this has been about two months ago uh I kind of had an idea of where I picked up with the puppies knowing that she had a problem and, and I've used those six senses before to find things that I need to find dogs that I needed to find when one, you know, accidentally got lost um, is that everything in life has electromagnetic receptors, including plants. And then I found out that sharks have them to the extent that they can recognize prey, a food source a thousand miles away and even know if it's one that's the type of food that they really like, and that the human heart has even more receptors. So how much more we're able to really connect that we aren't aware of. Maybe this sounds, like I said, maybe this sounds naive or whatever, but I, I do believe that there's a way of connecting with everything in nature. Well, well that is a, you really are talking about genuine awareness and the synchronistic realms you know i mean there's this i'll tell a quick couple a couple of quick anecdotes marion woodman said a lot of her patients when their children would go into labor a hundred miles away or a thousand miles away they would the women would experience labor pains in their own body the mother and my wife when when her daughter conceived you know she was trying to have a baby and one day my mother uh, wife sees a uh uh, her her daughter as an oven and a baby comes out you know and uh, then we waited about a month yeah she's she was expecting well when was it? it was about that night that you had the dream and the the other aspect now talk about you don't have the energy is unknown okay there's no way of knowing the energy you know where they, they they here's something they do in quantum uh, physics they they take an electrons that are both spinning in clockwise direction they split them so that they're very far apart. And then they only on the one on the right, they put a magnet on it so that it spins in the counterclockwise direction. This one over here that there's no connection with, it spins counterclockwise too. You know. So now we're in the realm of, you know, where I don't know where. But they call that this, ent entanglement theory. Yeah. Yeah. There's no. Uh, explanation for it you know uh, it's there there um what is it there are no words or systems of thought that can contend contain boundless life can, that can contain 
the archetype of life, you know. Well, anyway, I think we've run out of time, haven't we, Gary? Yeah, I think we're out. Yeah. Um, okay. Out next time. Well, next time we'll start with uh, an animus fairy tale. We've talked about the anima enough. So we're now going to talk about the archetype of meaning. Okay. We've been talking about the archetype of life. Now, the archetype of meaning is the one that takes the images she sends to us and, um, and makes them uh, into consciousness, turns them into consciousness through, uh, through symbol formation, too. Uh, Gary. Anyway, we'll see you guys all next time. Thanks to ha have everybody there. Annette, Nance, Azine, and Miles, Camilla, Kristen, Dawn, and Cheryl, and Gary. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.